a stranger in a cloak knocks on the door, asking if anyone is home to open it. With his other hand, he holds a man who can barely stand on his feet and needs help. The blonde is angry that someone has come again, and this has been going on for three months. The woman is dressed in a man's manner, her shirt is tucked into her pants, and she is wearing a cloak. She indignantly asks what kind of madman has come this time. In life, there are always at least two or three absurdities, and a great example is that this world is a novel. And this blonde was reborn in the world of this novel. It didn't bother her much because she quickly got used to the new world. But now things are not so simple in her life. She stands nearby and sees two men at the door. One of them is lying on the road, the other is crouching down and waiting like a dog. The woman is angry with the uninvited guests and wonders if they are going to leave. Her neighbor Andrew comes up to her and asks if she's been away on a business trip. The blonde replies that she was and quite far away. She tells her neighbor that this is the sixth person to come to her for help. It all started when someone fell under her house. It turned out to be a girl whom she gave first aid. The girl recovered surprisingly quickly, as if she had not been ill at all. After this incident, gossip spread in front of her house, and sick people began to gather. It was only because of her self-isolation that they began to come much less. However, this still hindered Syrinx's business, because she is a jeweler, not a healer. The next time a person appeared at the door, she was angry. Her shop was located in the western part of the city of Crixus, which was the largest city in the empire. The city has five districts, and Miss Syrinx's store is located in the first one. It is teeming with many gambling and auction markets. Syrinx is an illegal jeweler who manages to make a good living in this dirty neighborhood. Andrew, a neighbor, advises her to change her profession, as he thinks she will earn more money from healing. She explains that healing requires a license. Otherwise, if caught, you face the death penalty. There are special forces in the world, such as magic, alchemy, divine power, and spirits. People who heal others are called healers, and Syrinx is one of them. All people with special powers are registered in the church, but to practice this profession, you need to get a license. It is illegal to treat without a license. In case of violation of the rule, the temple, or rather the temple's dog named Marquis Forseti, carries out the punishment. Standard torture is the cutting off of one or two limbs. Some may be beheaded later. Syrinx decided that she would never do this. She already had a job she loved. Andrew says the man at her door needs help. Syrinx automatically agrees and is going to deal with the stranger. The neighbor laughs and says that he did not expect anything else from her. The stranger heard the noise of the conversation and turned in their direction. Andrew suddenly remembered his work and quickly said goodbye and left. The woman gave her neighbor a slightly angry look, and the stranger got up from the ground and ran to meet her. He said hello and asked if she was the owner of the house. Syrinx confirmed by asking what he needed. The man introduced himself as No Name. This is a nickname people use when hiding their identity on the street. He told the woman that he was leaving our honorable husband. The man is lying on the road in front of the house. Syrinx thought that if someone from the outside heard the shameless words of a stranger, they would think that she was providing services of a different nature. All the people she treated were respected people. But it is not known who this time. While she was thinking, the stranger shouted that he was relying on her and started running away. The woman tried to stop him with a question, but he apologized and left. Syrinx remained unanswered, annoyed that she had to take care of an unknown person as a patient, as if her house had become a shelter. As she got closer, she saw a torn shirt on his chest with traces of blood on the fabric. She sat down next to him, wondering if she would have the strength to carry her husband. The woman regretted that Andrew had left and would not help with her husband's relocation. Having lit a torch, Syrinx realized that the unknown man was seriously injured. As she continued to examine, she saw the man's face, and it struck her very much. She shrieked with embarrassment. The unidentified man was a handsome man with blonde hair. After looking some more, the woman managed to recognize him as Heimdall Vespergo. Vespergo's family was once known for its power, and at one point he lost everything. He is one of the characters in the novel, and he is the antagonist. The man opened his eyes and tried to speak. Syrinx leaned in to hear better, and the blonde tried to take her hand. The woman was frightened and pulled out her arm and exclaimed, asking what he was doing. For safety, he immobilizes his arm by stepping on it. She recalls that the novel she was reading was unusual. 
The main characters of the first and second parts were different, and the genre was also different. The first part tells the story of the main character and her harem, and later she gets into a fight and dies. In the second part, the protagonist is the cousin of the previous protagonist. It tells about how she misses her sister, and suddenly a second storyline begins in which she falls in love with different men. This part describes their relationship with all physical contact, which is why the book was rated 18 plus. Heimdall Vespergo is the only man who did not have a relationship with the protagonist in the second part. On the contrary, he hated her, saying that the main reason he was living was her death. The hatred for each other has been going on for generations. The protagonist's parents kidnapped the young Heimdall brothers to avenge their ancestors. As a result, one of the brothers is killed and then Heimdall is sold to the slave market where someone buys him. As a child, he saw a lot of cruelty. The boy is so broken that he eventually grows up to be the embodiment of revenge. The main object of his revenge is, of course, the main character, Frey. This resilient and extremely intelligent man tortured the protagonist without any mercy. That is why he is the main antagonist. And right now he's lying in front of Syrinx with a look on his face like he's about to kill someone. A few more seconds and he loses consciousness. According to what the novel tells us, it is better not to cross paths with him, but then why did the antagonist come to Syrinx? She had no answer to this question. She thought that perhaps the stranger who brought the victim was his mentor. There is also speculation that he is one of the five feudal lords who rule this area. The mentor and Heimdall are a problem for the woman because they know very unkind people. No wonder he is the main antagonist. But his good looks were confusing, so Syrinx gave him first aid, covered him with a blanket, and decided to leave him on the street. It's better not to cross paths with him at night. A handsome man is a bad guy in a word. In the morning, the woman planned to check on him and what to do with him. In the morning, Andrew's neighbor helped carry the wounded man into the house. A neighbor remarked that it was the first time he had ever seen a man bigger and heavier than their traitor. Syrinx sat down on a chair next to the bed where the wounded man is lying, gathering his hair in a ponytail. She assesses his health as seemingly alive. Andrew chews on his sandwich and says that Syrinx has saved so many influential people that she could have chosen one of them to marry and close the shop. Syrinx smiles and replies that all the rescued were women and begins to list their activities. The head of an assassin's guild, a vicious traitor, an aristocrat who kidnapped people from an auction hall, a knight who turns a blind eye to crimes, a gloomy dark sorceress. These are the personalities she met. Unfortunately, they all love handsome men. Andrew went on to say that they should be grateful to her for the lives she saved. Syrinx warned that it is better not to tell anyone about this if you want to live. The neighbor didn't give up on his advice. Now she has a male patient for the first time, so he thinks she should take advantage of it. Andrew reminded me, almost in the closed doorway, of the basic rule that you should not interfere even when you are worried about someone because you never know who might kill you and when. Syrinx promised to be careful. To cure it, you need to take off your clothes. But what if her husband attacks her with a knife, for example? That's what the woman thought before proceeding with further treatment. The man woke up and asked for his glasses, and Syrinx gave them to him. Looking at her, he asked who she was. Syrinx tried to look nice and explained that she had found him unconscious under her door yesterday and saved him. Heimdall changed in face and grabbed the woman by the shoulders, asking if he had done anything strange yesterday. Syrinx said no, and that she was so tired yesterday that she left him outside. She apologized and explained that she was unable to bring him into the house alone. She also asked to be released because she was in pain. The man let go of her shoulders and apologized, explaining that he was a little out of it, especially changing at night. Syrinx points to his wound and says that she only provided first aid, but the wound should not be left in this condition because it could become infected. Once he agrees to continue treatment, he has to undress, said Syrinx. The man was a little upset, but he obeyed. Now he is obedient, has a good appearance and character, a typical protagonist, which he is. However, readers gave him a nickname because he behaves like an innocent lamb by day and a ruthless wolf by night. That's why he was nicknamed Jekyll and Hyde. In other words, Heimdall has a split personality. The reason why Syrinx stayed as far away from Heimdall as possible was because his dark personality always woke up at night. During the day, he was so different that even his eye color seemed to change. 
The woman applied a bandage and continued to look at the man, mentally admiring his pumped up body. She even wanted to touch him again. The man suspected something and asked if she was too close. Syrinx asked a rhetorical question about the normal distance between a doctor and a patient. He apologized and said that he had the wrong thoughts in his head. The woman wanted to know the details of his thoughts, but she did not ask. In the novel, his blue eyes are described as precious stones, and his gaze is as deeply unknown as the sea, the image of a shy, reserved person. Such innocent beauty attracts people, but at night the second personality wakes up and all innocence disappears. Syrinx apologized in advance and asked if she could touch him. The man blushed deeply, not understanding the question. She had to explain to Heimdall that she heals through touch, so she warns him about it right away. Out of shame, he hid his face in his hands and explained that he didn't know how to talk to the opposite sex, so he kept making mistakes. The woman secretly holds a blue stone in her hands, warns that it will hurt a little and asks for patience. She noticed that Heimdall has a tearful nature, so she asks him not to cry. Heimdall asks not to laugh at him and gives him permission for medical manipulations. The woman held a crystal between her palms, brought her hand close to the man's body, concentrated, and the stone shone. The crystal was hovering in the air without anything, its light healing the wound right before our eyes. The man was pleasantly surprised. He asked her if she was a healer, and she denied it because she was doing it illegally and asked him not to tell anyone about it. Mentally, she estimated that she had used up a lot of mana because of the deep wound, and the crystal had darkened. Syrinx reminds us that illegal immigrants face the death penalty, and she doesn't want to die in agony. It should be noted that the temple also punishes those who are being treated, so if a man does not keep his mouth shut, he will be literally shortened. The man understood what kind of church we were talking about. It was an altar of discipline. He knew about their severe punishments and had no intention of telling about the incident. Cyrene asked him not to say anything to the Marquis of Forsyth, and he agreed. The ability to heal people is a precious gift, and this world also believes so. The Altar of Discipline is the most influential temple in this world. It is a group of priests who fight against rule breakers. The church is run by the family of the Marquis of Forseti. The head of the family is the paladin Yuvan Forseti, who is popularly nicknamed a hero. As for Juwan Forseti himself, his obsession with the protagonist in the first part of the film was followed by his obsession with the heroine of the second part. This was facilitated by Frey's ability to heal. After the death of the first protagonist, the second one gained powerful healing powers. In other words, the healing power aroused men's curiosity. Syrinx is not particularly happy about this power. She treats people by extracting magic from gemstones, and her method of treatment is rare. Therefore, if the church catches her, she will be punished. I am glad that it is located in a place where it will be difficult to find. So as long as no one came for her, she could do what she was doing. The woman asked if Heimdall was still worried about something, and he replied that everything was fine now thanks to her. She was happy about this and asked the guest to leave, pointing to the open door. The man did not want to leave so easily, saying that he needed to thank me and say goodbye properly. Syrinx smiled sweetly and stubbornly escorted the healthy patient out, pushing the man in the back. After closing the door behind him, she decided that she had done a good job and was done with him. But a few days later, she met Heimdall again, and it was important that it happened deep in the night. That day, she was returning late from a very difficult business trip when a man's voice called her in the middle of the street. He said that he had been waiting for her for a long time, and he also knew that she had recently earned some money. Syrinx recognized the man. His name was Torcha. He had recently tried to deceive her but failed, and now he came to take revenge. He is the head of an assassin's guild called the Blessing of Darkness. He asks how she can keep such a brazen face in front of her husband. He finds it disgusting. Syrinx asked if he was tired of coming to her. She didn't feel afraid. He seemed to irritate her like an annoying fly. The man said that she could not count on the security guard because he chose a special day, Friday, which falls in the middle of the month. The woman also knew that the knight was not patrolling the neighborhood at the moment, but was drinking in a bar. She smiled and said that she hadn't even thought of pinning her hopes on the guard. Syrinx began to mock the man, calling him a brainless bastard, and that he was a nobody with no eyes or shoulders. Torcha got angry, called her names, and threatened her. 
saying that people like her become obedient when their pretty faces are painted. Syrinx asked why he was so excited because he couldn't take her like that. Leaning over, she put her palm to his forehead to measure Torch's height. She kept mocking his short stature, imagining how small his brain was. The man wanted to grab or hit Cyrene, but she managed to defend herself with the crystal she had held in her left fist beforehand. She used magic that made the man's arm croak. Heimdall appears from behind me and asks, My God, what's going on here at this hour? Syrinx is surprised to see him. The man asks who he is and tries to hit Heimdall. They put a footrest on him and the man lands on the road. Heimdall says he doesn't need to know who he is. Then Heimdall approaches the woman, says hello, and says that she knows him and probably understands why he came to this alley. If she tells him everything that happened, he won't kill her. Syrinx realizes his danger instead of innocent blue eyes. Unfamiliar red eyes look at her. From the novel she read earlier, she knows that Heimdall does crazy things at night. He told the second protagonist that even if she gave everything she could, he would not accept it because he wanted only one thing, to cut her throat. Syrinx does not say anything to her husband. He repeats that she must do as he says. The woman cautiously clutches a red stone in her hand. He demands only the truth. He thinks that she knows him exactly, but it is unclear why he cannot remember her. Suddenly, a knife flew at Heimdall's back, and he managed to react and deflect it. Torcha held onto another man and continued to cling to Serence. He said he would not allow himself to be humiliated. He called the woman Damn Syrinx and that he would not forgive her. She was surprised, and Heimdall watched calmly. Syrinx asked why Torcha was angry with her if Heimdall had hit him, and she pointed her finger at the blonde. Torcha shouted indignantly that she had brought this man, bewitched him, and forced him to hit her. The woman asks how he got to this point. He threatens that she will regret hurting a member of the Blessing of Darkness. She explains that she did not do anything to him. Pointing her finger in Torch's direction, she says that she won't touch him even if he asks, because he is ugly. Heimdall laughed at the woman's words and continued to watch. Syrinx explained with a smile that she is an esthete and likes handsome men because character is reflected in appearance. For this reason, she will never choose Torch, and he can go away. He shouted at her to shut up, but Syrinx continued to tell him that his subordinates were talking about him the same way. They say that his face and nature are just as ugly. Torch was tearing up and threatening to kill the woman, but he was restrained by a subordinate who asked his boss to return before daylight. Syrinx advises them to leave while they can still walk on their own two feet, and asks if he might have wanted to get a good deal this time. The man is angry. He says that she cannot be rude to him all the time, and he threatens to paint her face and send her to the fifth district for sale. She added that she wanted him to live to see this moment. The subordinate was eventually able to take his boss home. Heimdall smiled and described her as a cold-blooded girl. Syrinx realized that they were alone on the street, and if someone heard the critics, they would not intervene anyway. The blonde man pulled out a knife and said that before he asked her name, he was wondering what kind of relationship she had with that man. She replied that he had wanted to rob her at the first meeting. Heimdall clarified that the man was not robbed, and the woman confirmed that, in short, yes. She realized that the blonde man could easily kill her. He brought the knife close to my face and ordered me to respond in the same way from now on. Leaning down to her ear, he asked why she was running away from the answer. He wanted her to tell him everything. She asked what exactly, clutching the stone in her hand. He replied that he wanted to know how she knew him. Heimdall said that he lives on the run and sees few people, so he wondered how she could know him. He offers to come in and talk, and they have a long conversation to learn about their shared memories. Inside the house, he tied her hands and sat down nearby. The woman said that she had saved him, and she was worried that he would get angry at her intervention. He smiled, saying that he had been thinking for a long time about how he could recover quickly after the attack, so it was her fault. Syrinx corrected him, saying that it is usually called help, not guilt. Heimdall denied it and said he loved being hurt. The woman told him everything and asked him to let her go, and he could not thank her for the treatment. He marveled at the fact that she was not easily confused. Even in such a situation, she remained unperturbed. Syrinx explained that this is the norm for life here. Kidnapping, extortion, hooliganism. Everyone who lives here has seen this more than once. She kept silent, 
saying that she knew his miserable personality and therefore had nothing to be surprised about. She complained of pain in her hands and asked to be untied again. He noticed that she spoke calmly, obviously confident that she would not die. Heimdall said that when he woke up a few days ago, there was an unknown address on the table and he is very curious. Syrinx realized that he was smart no matter what time of day it was. But during the day, he didn't make any unnecessary movements because he didn't have confidence in his actions. Heimdall's personalities do not remember each other's memories. The daytime Heimdall does not remember what happened at night, and the nighttime Heimdall does not remember what happened during the day. When one personality wakes up and something happens that he doesn't know about, Heimdall becomes vulnerable. Night Heimdall is generally obsessed with knowing what happened while he was sleeping, and this is very bad for Cyrene. She just got home today, and probably the daytime Heimdall wanted to meet her, but couldn't because she was away. It turned out that the wrong Heimdall came to her by his own decision. Obviously, he has a certain interest in her. Otherwise, he would have killed her at the beginning and not put on a show. However, Syrinx has no idea what kind of interest he has in him. The man concluded that she was an illegal healer, exposed her arm to the elbow, and cut himself despite her protests. Then he asked if she could heal his wound. The woman thought he was a psycho, and Heimdall wants her to prove her point. She said that her skills are worth a lot. He asked her why she helped someone like him. The woman explained that he behaved differently. Heimdall realized that it was a daytime job. The woman said that he had warned her about his strange behavior at night. Although she treats people, she does not like to look at blood. Syrinx brought her bound hands to his wound, and the light of healing shone. He saw a healthy arm and asked how she managed to do it. She looked at him angrily, waiting for him to let her go and go home. Heimdall leans closer, apologizing for scaring her, but he is curious that she is the first person to sit quietly when threatened. Syrinx replies that there is a first time for everything. The blonde thinks that maybe it's because he killed others right away. He asks her what she thinks about it, and she replies that she doesn't know. But if she wanted to, she would kill him without hesitation. He also likes to take his opponents by surprise. With that, she freed herself from the rope. Heimdall looked at his free hands in confusion. Syrinx put her palms together, and a light burst from under them, pushing the man back. He grabbed for the knife, but Syrinx shouted the word Sientate, and the man was unable to move. She came up to him, took the knife from his hands, and asked him if he was surprised, saying with a smile that now it was the other way around. Syrinx said that she would not apologize because he had been overconfident, thinking that it would be easy with her. Heimdall asked what she had done. The woman explained that in addition to treating people, she knows several spells that can protect her. As an illegal healer, she should have such a safety net. But she could not use the spell on others because it only works on the opposite sex. Syrinx expressed her joy that he was a man. She hopes that he will not be offended by her because she did the same to him as he did to her. He asked what she was going to do with him now. Syrinx says that he knows how some species of animals spoil the ecosystem, but he will let him go anyway. He will do it during the day. He asked what would happen if he came back and she was in danger. Syrinx replied that she could make her spell last for about a month. Now the man was sitting in front of her, tied up with rope from hand to foot. She sat down across from him and said, Look at him. You don't seem to mind. In response, he said that he would not forget it. The woman said it was funny because he wasn't the first one to do that to her. Heimdall said that he was selfish and that she should hope for magic to help her. She agreed because her life is precious to her. The man asked how the spell sounded. Syrinx explained that sientate means sit down. Heimdall huffed. The woman said goodnight and went to her room relieved. When Heimdall woke up in the morning, he saw a woman he knew holding glasses. The man's eyes turned blue, and Syrinx put on his glasses. The blonde asked if he had done anything wrong at night. Syrinx decided to play a little trick on Heimdall and said that he had been molesting her. He was shocked and felt guilty, and the man started to cry a little. Syrinx was surprised at his emotions, wondering where that bandit had gone. The man said on all fours that he would take responsibility. Then he repeated it again, confident that he would take full responsibility for whatever happened. Syrinx asked how he would take responsibility. Heimdall, blushing, said he would marry her. But the woman refused, explaining that she was joking and that there had been no harassment. 
she mentally marveled at the difference in her husband's behavior. The blonde asked why he was tied up. Cyrene replied that he had threatened her with a dagger. He failed to wound her thanks to the skills she possesses. There are three categories of people who need to be extremely careful in their alley. The elderly, women, and children. But the question is why they don't want to leave. The fact is that they have their own benefits, so everyone is doing their best. The man listened to her explanations with seriousness and then asked if she could help him this time. Heimdall admits that he is an unscrupulous person, but if she helps him, he will do anything. Syrinx stopped him in mid-sentence. It was unusual for her to see the blonde so confused, but she was in no hurry to trust him. She explained that she would listen to him, but reminded him of her rule not to interfere in the affairs of those she treated. She also wants nothing to do with him, and her husband was a little upset by her words. He asked me to listen to him. Heimdall said that it was not him that night and continued to explain his lost memories. Syrinx feigned surprise, as if she knew nothing about him, all in order to hear his version. The man explained that he could not describe or stop what he was doing at night. She asked if this was due to the fact that he was bloody that day, and the blonde man confirmed. Syrinx said that someone brought him to her, after which he lost consciousness. She assumes that he may have told her to bring him here. The woman asked if he knew who brought him. Heimdall replied that it was a trustee. He wanted to name it, but Syrinx stopped him saying that he shouldn't say it. She didn't want to find out too much and then get into trouble. It was better not to know even his name. Heimdall looked at her, blushed, and tilted his head to ask why she disliked him so much. Is he not very good? The man continued to say, playing with his fingers in embarrassment. The woman clarified whether he was talking about his appearance, and the blonde man was referring to her words that she did not want to contact him. The man is sad about this. He did not realize that everything was so bad with him. He is trying to prove that he is not as bad as she thinks. Heimdall says he really doesn't know how he ended up in her house and apologizes for it. In case he comes to her again, the man asks her to cure him again. The blonde promises to pay for her treatment at any cost. Cernix touches his lips with her fingers to stop him from making promises. She smiles and says that you have to be careful with your tongue in this alley. Syrinx runs her finger along the man's unbuttoned shirt collar and asks what if he has asked for something unexpectedly special. The blonde is embarrassed and blushing. The woman thought about asking for such a thing and smilingly asks Heimdall how about paying with her body. The blonde bounced off her and asked why she didn't ask him to do some physical work. He assured her that he was better at it. The woman joked that she couldn't believe it. A lot of bad things happen in this neighborhood. Looking at him, she realized that there was a high probability that such a handsome man would be sold into slavery in the fifth district and would not be treated innocently. Having experienced the slave trade as a child, he will never forgive them. Therefore, in about three years, this market will burn to the ground. Syrinx agreed to treat the man further. In truth, she is pursuing her goal, to find a special gem and nothing else matters. When the main character is on stage, secondary characters can easily go unnoticed. The more leading characters, the better for Syrinx. Heimdall thanked her for agreeing, as it seemed to him that she didn't really want to treat people. Mentally, she praised his insight. She knew that in time he would discover a way to heal himself, but for now she would help. Syrinx explained that she doesn't like to see people bleed to death. She knows that the course of the novel will not change because she heals him several times. After a while, he will forget all the good things she did. Then, after one great and terrible event, he will become the main antagonist. After he said thank you again, Syrinx said that there was no need to thank him, because it was not free. She asked her husband if he thought she would not ask for anything. The blonde asked what she wanted. Syrinx asked what he could give. The man touched his ear and said he was smart. The woman remembered that in the novel, in both parts, he was the smartest of all. In addition to his looks, he is a good cook and has a lot of money, Heimdall said. Syrinx replied that she had enough money and was not interested in cooking because she buys all her meals in a neighboring house. She stretched her hands to his hair and said, I'm not sure about his head, just like his appearance. She thought that it was hard for her to believe in an antagonist with such an appearance, but it was better not to fall for it. 
Heimdall was a little embarrassed, then pointed to a table with a pile of papers and said he could help with the accounting. Looking at it from a distance, the man says that there is an error in the middle of the calculation when multiplying, it should be 9,097. It is more convenient to make such calculations vertically rather than horizontally. Syrinx was amazed at his abilities and surprised that he could see what was written on the sheets pinned to the board behind the desk with the documents. He replied that he had good eyesight. Cernix wanted to ask why she was wearing glasses then, but she restrained herself. Heimdall asked if she follows market trends, and he could tell from the payment system that she does, but some things are not properly organized, so he offered to help with that. Syrinx mentally admitted that she was not very good at it. The man promised to manage. Apparently, he would work for her as an accountant and secretary. She seriously considered this prospect, realizing that she now had her first regular patient. Syrinx looked at her husband and asked what they would do with him at night. What if another Heimdall came? She is not happy about the fact that she will be visited every night with a stab wound. The man advised me to hit the night guest with a frying pan, preferably with the edge of it. The woman was surprised, but agreed to treat the man, preferably during the day, and he promised not to harm her. The next night, the wounded Heimdall was lying on the road in front of the house again. Syrinx mockingly called him a puppy, asked him if he had gotten someone again and no one brought him this time. Heimdall advised the woman not to speak to him in such a sarcastic tone. She said that the daytime he allowed her to hit him if necessary. The blonde asked what kind of nonsense she was talking about. Syrinx explained in more detail that he advised me to beat with a frying pan, and they chose which one was better together. He was a little quiet at her words. Of course, she was not going to do that to him. Cyrene only had a spell that didn't hurt a man, so there's nothing wrong with having a backup plan. She asked him if he understood his condition now and what kind of life he led. Knife wounds, burns. She wonders how he is still conscious after such a beating. Heimdall does not address her by her first name, but calls her girl. He corrects her words that at such moments it is better to say after a fight rather than call it a beating. The blonde asks, did I tell you that I was beaten? She replied that she came to this conclusion because he looked like a stray dog. Anyone who sees his wounds will come to this logical conclusion. He says that people usually ask him where he was wounded, and he doesn't look like someone who can be beaten. The woman tried to object, but Heimdall interrupted her, saying that during the day he could only guess what he was doing at night, but he could not know for sure. He asked what she knew about him. Syrinx thought she was caught. She asked him about the expression on his face, as if he was going to wring her neck. She reminded him that she had saved him last time and asked if he even realized it. Thanks to her, he is now living peacefully. A person who survived thanks to it shouldn't talk like that unless he has lost his shame. And he looks at her as if she owes him something. In such a situation, even a bow is not enough. Syrinx kept telling Heimdall that he hadn't even said thank you. The woman says that she knows people like him well, who are ready to team up with the killer to achieve their goals. People like him can even drive a knife into their parents if necessary. She understands that this may be normal for his way of life, but she should not be treated with such hatred. He wanted to ask her something, but Searings told him to shut up and continued to say that in any case, he would not be harmed because she could treat him. Smiling, she asked if he had changed his mind about killing her. It seems as if he is unbearably annoying, but in fact, she is pretending to teach him a lesson. Syrinx says that he continues to stare angrily. It's good that he is not in bad shape, but he needs to be treated as soon as possible because there is a threat of being crippled. His arm needs quick treatment. Syrinx took the rope and approached the man, who asked what she was doing. She replied that she was tying him up and added, I know how to tie up animals, you stupid evil sir. Heimdall replied that if she wanted to be killed, she could continue to talk like that. She said that if he swung his big fist at her, she would scream out loud in fear. He jokingly asks what will happen if he accidentally drowns it in the river. The woman feigns sadness that he will not be able to get out of the river with his hands tied. The blonde says that even he seems to be kinder than her. Syrinx agrees and reminds him of the last time he met her with a knife. Heimdall believes that her eyes betray fear. The woman says that he wants her to be afraid because he is a pervert. Eventually, he surrendered and Syrinx began to heal him. The blonde asked how long the treatment would last. Syrinx replied that the gemstone treatment was painful and took some time. But if he was patient, he would get a candy as a reward.
She asks Heimdall how it is possible to treat your body like this, because one day it may not be able to withstand it. He asked if she had a similar experience. The woman continued to examine the wounds with concentration. Then she asked me to raise my head to treat my neck. She wondered how much pain he could endure and how long he had been subjected to violence. Heimdall assumes that she has a good life. So what is the reason that she helps him? Syrinx replied that there are two types of people who live in such neighborhoods, the victim and the criminal filled with guilt. The man looked at her and said that she didn't seem to feel guilty. Perhaps it's sympathy. He thinks she's already been through something similar, or someone in her circle has. Syrinx said she was not obliged to answer his questions. He says he understands human emotions well. The woman advises to analyze her emotions after treatment. When she finished, she stood up and said she was leaving. Holding the doorknob, she realized that she could not leave him on the street. It's winter, it's cold, and despite the fact that she cured him, his fatigue remains. She turned around and said she would give him a choice. He sleeps here on the street, or he makes a promise about something and sleeps in the house. He clarified the promise. Syrinx told him not to harm her. Heimdall said he would and asked why. Syrinx asked him if he felt okay when he continued to talk defiantly to his rescuer. As for the reasons, there are none. He did not believe that she had no reason. The woman replied that not everyone was like him, but agreed to tell me something. Firstly, she has been through a lot, and secondly, she has two younger children, one of whom was injured when his father hit him and seriously damaged his eyes. That's why she can't look at people's traumas calmly afterwards. She told him everything. He listened to her so she can go inside, but first she has to swear on a red gem. He smiled and asked me why I was doing it. Syrinx jokingly asked him to repeat after her, from now on, I will be a good person. Heimdall refused to repeat himself. In fact, he had to repeat that he would not harm Syrinx in any way that night. After that, he was allowed to enter the house. The man asked what would happen if he broke his promise. The woman replied that she would simply put him in chains, but if he kept his word, everything would be fine. When they entered the house, she pointed to the sofa in the living room and offered to spend the night there. Heimdall asked if she would go up the mountain because he wanted her to stay close by. He says his body became hot. Syrinx grimaced and asked the man to stop talking nonsense and have a good rest. He asked her why she didn't go to the mountain, and Syrinx replied that she was a busy person. The money didn't come by itself. Then she went to her desk. A man in a hat and coat entered the room. Syrinx was delighted to see her favorite customer. She asked what she could do to help him, and the gentleman in the hat noticed that she was just as hospitable. The woman asked what could change, because her kindness and loyalty like precious stones are not changeable. This is her iron rule. The man pulled out a bag from his bosom and handed it to the woman, his hands trembling for some unknown reason. Syrinx asked if she could pay with gold as usual. He agreed and asked me to do it as soon as possible. The woman knows that he is a regular customer who brings good things, but today he is not the same. When Syrinx gave the master the gold, he quietly told her that he shouldn't say such things, but that she should be careful. After saying that, the man in the hat quickly walked away, and the woman tried to stop him, but in vain. The first thing that came to mind from his words was that the boss of the neighboring organization might have changed. I'll have to check tomorrow. Syrinx sat down at the table to look through the things in her bag, with Heimdall sitting on the couch across from her. He commented that she had an unusual guest, a gentleman covered in cold sweat. The woman replied that the gentleman did not usually behave like that, but today he was strange. The blonde explained that people behave this way when they are threatened by something terrible. The woman skeptically asks why he is saying such a terrible thing. Heimdall asked what was wrong with her face. She was completely different with clients. In response, Sirens also asked if he wanted her to be nice to him. The man was silent. Syrinx was holding a small diamond with tweezers. She was happy and said that the goods were good today. The blonde man's presence made her feel like a stray cat. Even a predator had gotten into her house. Heimdall was somewhat reminiscent of a Bengal cat. The man asked what she was doing, and Syrinx explained that she was examining gems. He clarified that he was asking about the profession in general, or whether it plans to produce its own goods. She says why he asks about it, Maybe he has developed an interest in her. He smiled at her guess and asked her what she thought of him. Isn't his face beautiful? It's expensive. 
Cyrene blushed a little as Heimdall tore off a button on his shirt with his teeth to show off his strong torso. She waved her head to the side and asked me not to disturb her, as she needed to finish her work by morning. Heimdall smiled and said that she would be the most reliable person in the family. Syrinx asked what kind of unemployed man he might be. The blonde man replied that he would be a butcher man who kills people. She thought she should stop talking to him. She came across a blue stone and she judged it to be pure and precious. At this time, the blonde is quietly dozing. The woman holds up the next dark blue stone against the light and is happy to have finally found a worthwhile specimen. With the help of her power, she is able to detect a valuable gem. This skill has been passed down in her family since childhood. Thanks to him, Syrinx can live her life in an interesting way. The man asked if there was anything valuable, and Syrinx replied that it was not easy to find something valuable. Suddenly, Heimdall stood up, which scared the woman a little. At the bottom of the bag, she notices something that makes her wary. Heimdall picks up a dagger and says that the house will soon be surrounded. Shadows flicker outside the windows. Now Syrinx realized what the gentleman in the hat was warning about. The woman takes out an expensive pendant from her bag and explains that it is a stolen item. She says that everyone in the empire wants to get this gem. It seems that they are surrounded by knights from the outside and they are not going to leave. This is because she is holding a very valuable item for a high-ranking family. He is a count who is related to the imperial family. That's why the knights came here. The situation is not simple. The woman puts the gems back into the bag and ties it up. Syrinx says that the blonde is trapped just like her. The woman laughs and adds that he might be caught with her. She takes him by the hand and calls him to follow her so that the knights don't catch them. But if he doesn't want to, he can stay. Heimdall's face is full of doubt, and he says that it is a good idea to leave, but where will they go? Syrinx says that he shouldn't show his face to them to begin with. They go through a secret door. In the other room, the woman opens another door, and the blonde man asks if they are going to run away together. She smiles and says no. They end up in a neighborhood bar, which is a bar filled with customers, beer, and snacks. Syrinx explains that her secret door leads to the neighboring house. She thinks it's cool. Andrew greets the woman and asks her what's going on again, and she replies, the usual. A neighbor hands her a paper bag of food and receives a coin from her. Andrew asks if she's leaving, and he promises to buy her a drink next time on his own dime. He wonders why she is so serious and expresses hope that she will be okay. Syrinx asks us to wish her good luck as always. Andrew says that he would be sad if a good neighbor like her disappeared. The woman warns that if she is killed, it will be because of the evil eye, and she asks for a promise that Andrew will spit on him. He asked if it had anything to do with her recent trip. Andrew is concerned that his clients are disappearing one by one. The neighbor is not sure whether it will be useful for her, but if she needs to leave the first district, she should always walk towards eight o'clock and not turn off anywhere. Heimdall and Syrinx were walking along a deserted city road. The man spoke to her to hear some explanation. Cyrene thought he would leave her as soon as they left Andrew's bar. Usually, after treatment, he needs three days of rest, and it is not clear how he has the strength to follow her. Heimdall takes her hand and says that he is not against running away, but he does not understand why they are doing this, what the reason is, and asks for an explanation. The blonde says he won't let her go until he satisfies his curiosity. She repeats that the item is stolen, but the man doubts that this is a reason to run away. He is sure that an illegal immigrant like her is used to this kind of thing. Syrinx suspects that it's probably someone's plan, and it doesn't seem like a coincidence that the knights surrounded the house in the middle of the night. Moreover, it is strange that such a rare stone got into the hands of an illegal immigrant, which definitely indicates a trap. It is called the Tears of Aslot, the finest gem in the empire, with a history of 120 years. Eight years ago, the emperor gave this jewel to his younger sister when she married Count Amanti. The stone later became a family heirloom of Countess Amanti. Therefore, there is no one in the empire who does not know about this stone. However, the count recently announced that the family heirloom had disappeared. On behalf of the count, the search for this jewel continues. The count sent his knights to look for the jewel on the black market. For this reason, they walk all the time in the neighborhood where Syrinx lives. The gentleman in the hat was acting strangely, and Syrinx could see that he was afraid of something, but he was not the kind of man who would do that to her. Heimdall realized that someone was trying to frame her in this way. 
Syrinx assumes that someone wants to get rid of her, so they planted this thing. It seems that they are from the Torture Guild, the Blessings of Darkness, the ones Heimdall beat last time. The man replied that he had beaten many people. Cyrene says she doesn't want to know anything about his crazy life, and now she's referring to the man who came to her with that one. The blonde man asked if it was the one that looked like a catfish, and the woman confirmed that his people could have planted the stolen item. Heimdall says that she must have really pissed him off, and concludes that even clients can betray in the marketplace. Syrinx asked why he didn't leave. The blonde replied that when they were leaving the bar, a knight noticed him, and that he wouldn't be able to get far on his own in his condition. Heimdall leaned over to the woman and said that she had a safe place, and he asked her to take him there. He believes that since Syrinx has cured him, she must now be responsible for him. The woman replied that she had never provided post-treatment services to anyone. She was surprised by his impudence and said that he was the worst she had ever met. The man smiles and thanks for the compliment. Syrinx noticed that he was kinder to her because of his poor health. She takes him by the collar of his shirt and pulls him to her. Syrinx expresses her wish that he would continue to remember that she is helping him. Letting him go, the woman tells him to follow her if he wants to. Another point is that if he loses consciousness, Syrinx will not drag him. In the end, the woman called him a puppy. Heimdall replied that this was very generous of her. The blonde asked where they were going, and Syrinx said that they were going to the second district. The first one has small, illegal shops, and the second one has big shops, especially on the first street. If they follow the path Andrew advised, it is unclear whether they will be able to break away from their pursuers. On the way, they met three men who were talking to each other. On the sleeve of one of them, she noticed a symbol of the blessing of darkness. There was a bang to the side of Syrinx and Heimdall, and the men turned to the noise and noticed the strangers. One of the men appealed to the captain, and he ordered them to be removed. Syrinx realizes that they could have blocked all the exits. She clutches the blue gem in her hand, preparing for battle. He asks Heimdall if he can fight, but the blonde man is silent. A group of enemies run toward them, and the stone in the woman's palms begins to shine. Syrinx holds the illuminated stone in front of her and shouts, Viento! The attackers stop from a bright flash of light. Heimdall pulls out a dagger and warns the woman to be careful. He hits the first, second, and third men hard until each of them falls to the ground. Then the blonde looks at her and warns her that if she doesn't take responsibility for him, she will be in trouble. If she understands everything, he hopes that she will try harder in the future. Syrinx wondered how many gems she had with her. This dependence of her power on the stones is a major drawback, and she analyzed that she shouldn't use attack spells for now. You can't lose focus because you don't know how things might turn out. No one seems to be pursuing them anymore. A second neighborhood is visible nearby. The street is all lit up, but there are also people who rob and harass others. Syrinx says it's relatively safe here, so you can relax. She goes to a place she trusts. She noticed that Heimdall's breathing was erratic, and he asked if she was following him. The woman corrected that she was not following, but observing. Syrinx says she feels responsible for the fact that a seriously ill patient needs to go with her now, instead of resting. That is why she is watching him, Heimdall asks, since when she has been watching his breathing, if there is anything else she is interested in about him. Syrinx replies that he's glad he has the energy to joke. She stands and reflects on the blonde man's general condition. She healed his wounds and restored his broken arm, but his body is in shock from the quick magic treatment, so he needs time to recover. Cyrene noticed the man's gaze and asked why he was looking like a pervert, probably thinking about something stupid. He asks, what if so? The woman joked that she would shout Kaya, pervert, but in general, if he did not want to be tied up, he should be quiet. Syrinx walked up to the blonde, threw his arm over her shoulder, and with her other hand began to support him behind his back. Heimdall said she was a very unpredictable girl. So they walked on, and on the way, he asked if it was possible to gradually pay off the debt for the help. The woman replied that there would be no installments, and that he could only thank her now. Syrinx took his chin and turned his face away from her, saying that it was not easy for her now, so let him look forward. They came to the right place, and Heimdall praised the majestic building. Syrinx replied that the building was in the style of the owner himself. The central part was four stories high, 
and the two towers on the sides were significantly higher than the central one. There were guards on duty at the entrance, and they greeted Syrinx, saying that they hadn't seen each other for a long time. Upon entering, they were greeted by a luxurious interior. The ceiling and walls are richly decorated, with heavy, huge crystal chandeliers, paintings on the walls, beautiful furniture, and guards with swords. The guard invited me to go on. Luxury items accompanied the guests everywhere. Heimdall noted that the atmosphere here is unusual. Syrinx explained that the owner of the house believes that it is necessary to make sure that the guest is filled with a sense of fear from the very beginning, so that the client will feel that he is being pressed. The fact is that the owner of the house is a moneylender. Soon the guards told them that they were expected. The woman said that they seemed to know about their visit. A red-haired woman with green eyes was waiting for them in the room. She is a feudal lord of the second district and a moneylender. This is the second person Syrinx has cured. She is the richest person in the neighborhood. Syrinx bowed and greeted. It is good to see you, mistress of gold. The owner of the gold was smoking a thin, long pipe, the smoke wrapped around her figure in a black, strapless dress. She replied, It's been a long time, baby. The red-haired moneylender's name was Lintella Dulcinez. Lintella suggests not starting the conversation with unnecessary phrases, because that's not why they came here. Miss Dulcinez considers herself a business person, so she immediately asks why Syrinx was looking for her. Lintella has a habit of not speaking until she has taken two puffs. People who have reached heights in this field always have a habit that is difficult to understand. Syrinx assumes that the lady knows the reason, because she is the kind of person who easily learns such information. Lintella is known to have her own information network, and many of her clients are informants. Lintella agreed that she knew everything. Looking at Heimdall, she asked the healer when she had such a wonderful lover. She evaluates it as a rare product of high quality. Syrinx realized that the lady liked the blonde. Both of them had a good eye. Syrinx put her hand on the blonde man's leg and said that she had taken this man for herself. He belonged to her. Heimdall was a little surprised, but quickly realized that he took Syrinx's hand and pressed it to his chest. The man smiled and said he was sorry, but he had already sold out. The healer opened the bag with the stolen jewelry and asked if Lintella knew what it was. The lady doesn't seem to recognize the item and asks what it is. Syrinx realizes that the lady knows everything, but since she won't admit it, he'll have to tell her the truth. This thing was brought to her at the store, and Syrinx asks if it has anything to do with Lintella. The lady asks if the healer has become someone's bait. The money lender replies that she has nothing to do with it, although she is certainly curious who dared to hurt a person who is under the protection of a feudal lord of the second district. Syrinx thought that this man was involved in dirty deeds and not everyone could get close to him. For example, how the healer managed to save Lintella by accident. The red-haired lady asks what Syrinx wants from her. A woman puts a pendant with a precious stone on the table and asks if she will be safe if she asks the lady to help her get rid of it. Lintella says that it's nothing for her. She is able to fulfill her request. But has she forgotten anything? Syrinx says that's exactly what she needs. The red-haired lady clarifies that it will be a retribution for her rescue. She agrees to help and warns that her first request is canceled if Syrinx doesn't mind. At first, Syrinx wanted to leave this place so that not even a trace of her would remain. Therefore, the priority was to find a special stone that could fulfill this wish. Syrinx cannot give up her plan. She suggests that the lady do something else, and in return asks for similar stones. Lintella was surprised that the healer decided to bargain with her in such a situation. The woman smiled and said that the lady knew what she was capable of. The lady asked what Syrinx needed. The woman replied that she needed black pearls and a black diamond, and she believed that Lintella could do it without any problems. Lintella agrees because she knows Syrinx to be a good specialist in her field and does not want to lose her savior. Syrinx offers to talk about another topic. It seems that the lady is not her enemy, so the healer mentally hopes to ask Lintella for help right now. She started talking about a monthly auction house that brings in tons of jewelry. Among the jewels on display there, the most valuable is Princess Rosita's crown. It was very expensive, and the winner was Heteros Tenpa, who is the right-hand man of the moneylender. In other words, the winner of Lintel. There is no doubt that the price was astronomical, but what Lintella won at the auction is a good fake. The red-haired lady replied that the baby should realize the importance of her words. Syrinx agreed and offered to sign a contract for her arm, or even her head. 
She put her hand on her heart and said she was ready to give her life. The red-haired woman ordered the scroll to be brought in as proof of the truth. Magic determines the truth, and if a person lies, his heart immediately breaks. After seven years of use, the sale of the scroll was banned, but it is still available. Syrinx said it was a fake and tore the scroll and nothing happened to her. Lintella is shocked. Syrinx recalled how the deal with the imperial merchant went. She confirmed that the healer then discovered all the fakes that her appraiser had not even suspected. Everything from gemstones to jewelry. Therefore, Lintella cannot but trust the healer. Syrinx offers to auction the goods in return in three months. She realizes that even in this world, tycoons of Lintella's stature collect luxury goods to show off their wealth. But who decided to deceive Lintella and sell her a fake? For Lintella, this is not only a loss of property, but also a blow to her pride. The red-haired woman asks me to remind her again what Syrinx wants. The woman repeats that she needs black pearls and a black diamond. Lintella clarifies whether she is going to make a fake. Syrinx says she also needs fake identities for the two of them. Lintella agrees to fulfill the request and asks about her plans for the future. The healer says that if the plan is successful, they will be able to restore the lady's honor and take revenge with dignity. Everyone will know what these people did to the feudal lord of the second district. Syrinx mentally hopes that she will get a gem. Lintella replied that she sympathized with her courage and honesty. The red-haired girl hopes that Syrinx will not disappoint her. They brought fake IDs and stones in a black bag. Lintella asked about the time frame, and the healer promised that everything would be ready the day after tomorrow by dawn. The red-haired lady understands what benefits she can expect, but it is not clear what Syrinx will get from this deal, so she does not go away asking questions. Syrinx shows a rose and offers to pay her in flowers. Lintella smiles and says that they don't even cost a shilling. She asks the healer if the flowers from the lady are more valuable than precious stones. Syrinx replies that sometimes insignificant things are worth much more than gold coins and jewelry. It is important to her who this flower belongs to. Lintella returns to the topic of Heimdall and asks the healer about the possibility of buying this jewel. Syrinx replies that she has already bought the stone herself, and it is not for sale. She bows to the moneylender, saying that they will leave. Heimdall suddenly hugs Syrinx from behind and closes his arms around her stomach. The blonde looks at Lintella and says that unfortunately he has already sold out and has no plans to sell again. Syrinx and Heimdall left the moneylender's house. On the way, one of Lintella's subordinates gave him the key, saying that they would find a first aid kit on the spot. The owner said that the healer knew the place, and indeed Syrinx recognized the key she had used the previous time. There are no guarantees that they will be able to hide from their pursuers in this place, but they need to stay here for one night. Besides, there is no better option. Now that they have fake identities and stones, they need to get things done quickly. Syrinx walked forward in thought. The blonde walked behind her. At some point, the footsteps became quiet. The yellow gem was flying in the air ahead of the man. Syrinx began to think about being careful even when everything seems to be fine, Someone can grab her by the neck, but she has someone who can notice something wrong. The blonde grabs her by the shoulder, turns her around, and presses her against the wall. Syrinx asks what he is doing. Has it become fashionable to repay people for their kindness like this? The future that the woman knows is that the original Heimdall bought the crown from a feudal lord of the second district. Later, he found out that the crown was a fake. Because of this crown, Heimdall decides to take over all the feudal lord's property, and a fight breaks out between them. Now the blonde man has pinned Syrinx down with a knife and asks her how she knows the jewelry was fake. The woman was not afraid of his actions, saying that she had seen the crown before, and she also knows how to tell by a gem how long ago something was done to it. The fake crown she had seen earlier was well made professionally, but it hadn't been long since it was created so she could easily tell it was a fake. Cyrene says that it is her turn to ask him questions. She puts her hand on Heimdall's shoulder and asks him what kind of hobby he has for asking questions like that. The blonde says that she doesn't answer his questions any other way. The woman said that she was not a thrill seeker, but liked to give them to others. Then her hand squeezed the man's shoulder. Heimdall looks at her and says, Girl, you bought me, didn't you? So maybe you should use it. Cyrene remarks that he is not the kind of person who takes things seriously, and that she shouldn't have agreed to help him. 
Heimdall asks if she has ever thought about actually buying it. Syrinx replied that she does not buy useless jewelry. The blonde says with a smile that although he is useless, he is beautiful. She breaks free of his grasp and says that no matter how handsome he is, she doesn't want a jewel that will destroy her. The man replies that he is saddened to hear such words and asks if he is really useless to her. Heimdall points out that her body is just ordinary and her physical strength is below average. It seems that its power is associated with precious stones. He assumes that she will not be able to do anything if she is caught and the stones are taken away. In his opinion, this is too dangerous. Sirince asks if he wants to fight now. The man says no. He only hints that she needs someone to protect her. The healer says that he could put down his dagger and speak without it. The man refuses to do this. He wants to show her how defenseless she can be. He calls his actions an act of kindness. Heimdall says that a gem shows all its affection and she rejects it. It makes him sad. One of the gems flies in the palm of my hand. Syrinx smiles confidently and asks to see it, and then it will be seen who else will regret it. He attacks her and she defends herself. The glow of the stone flashes brighter when it comes into contact with the dagger blades and it shatters. Heimdall says that this is a typical trait of those who use spells. She believes in their power so much that it eventually becomes her weakness. Searing smiles and replies that she warned him that if he hurt her or acted against her will, she would tie him up. So now the blonde will receive his punishment. The woman points at him and says, arrest and lo. Shiny pink chains bind the man's arms and legs. He cannot move and falls to the ground in shock. Syrinx reminds him that she asked him not to behave like that. She would like to gloat more, but they don't have time for that. You need to hurry to that place and come up with a countermeasure against a person who can attack at any time. Cyrene calls to the man to get up and follow her. His legs are fine. Heimdall complains that she, the healer, tied him up and now is forcing him to leave. In his opinion, they were made for each other. The blonde man stands up and asks about the specifics of the spell he has been cast. He remembered that the spell took a certain amount of time to work. Syrinx begins to suspect the blonde that he has challenged her on purpose to learn more about the spell. Heimdall turns the conversation into a joke and later says that he was just experimenting. Syrinx notes that he does not spare his body at all, treating himself as an instrument. Now the blonde man is bound by a spell and is no longer a threat, so they move on. In the house, the woman wondered what room to give Heimdall, perhaps not a room but a storage room. Heimdall asks what her true identity is. Not only is she familiar with very influential people, but she also has the ability to distinguish between fakes and originals. In addition, he had heard of jewelers who could cast magic on gems, but this was the first time he had heard of anyone being treated with them. The woman thinks it's a good idea to put Heimdall in the barn. She suggests that he recover first, and only then ask such questions. The blonde asks if she will be safe once he recovers. Sirens replies that he can try if he wants to be pinned to the floor and tied up. Heimdall finds her words magical, and the healer thinks that his face sometimes makes him want to punch. The man lies down on the bench and repeats that he sincerely offers to buy her himself. She climbs the stairs to the top and replies that she is sorry, but she does not eat spoiled food. Upon entering the room, she heard her husband ask her if she was sure she wouldn't change her mind. Syrinx noticed that the room was dirty. She thought that Lintella's man was here, but the main thing is that there is a bed here, and she is grateful for that. The light of the lit torch fell on the papers with photos of the criminals wanted by the bounty hunters. Syrinx decides to clean up and go to bed. She threw the crumpled papers into the trash. Looking at the photo, she assesses the painting as not very good, and it is unlikely that anyone will find them. She remembers how a nice man in the neighborhood turned out to be a wanted criminal. The reward was insignificant, so none of the knights wanted to catch him. Syrinx remembered sitting with a friend in a bar, and how she said with a glass in her hand that no one would ever catch that man because of the dirty and corrupt world. As the fourth rescued patient, who knows about corruption, told her some people pay to have portraits drawn badly so that no one can find them. Looking closely at the papers, she recognizes the official seal of the altar of discipline. The letter refers to a special criminal. The remuneration is paid by the Holy See. You can report to the Marquis of Forsyth or the nearest church. A reward in the form of gold coins is paid for any information. This document is a stigma that makes a person an outcast for life. The next document was about a woman of 24 years of age, 
good-looking, skilled in healing spells, and a surviving member of the Aiden family. The Aiden family used gemstones as a source of their power. It was for this reason that the Altar of Discipline decided to exterminate all family members. This family was branded as criminals because the Altar of Discipline has a power that can only be compared to the power of the Imperial family itself. Syrinx finished reading and said, so this is what he looks like. On the day the Altar of Discipline recognized them as heretics, her entire family died at the hands of the Altar. In fact, the Altar wished to receive the same abilities that the Syrinx family had. All family members died for unknown reasons, and only one person survived. Surprisingly, only one person was able to survive that bloody war because he simply did not know how to use the abilities of his family. This person was little Syrinx. She remembers that there was another person present. He stepped over the bodies of the dead as he approached her. The blonde young man said that he had denounced her family because he considered them heretics. However, he asked to leave the girl alive because she was dear to him. He tells her that she will no longer belong to the Aiden family and reassures her that everything will be as it was before, because Syrinx is his childhood friend and future bride who will be helped by his parents. This guy with gray hair is the main male character of the first part of the novel, Esir Yuvan Forsetti. After that, the head of the altar and the bishop of the church that killed her family took the girl to the Duke of Adverse, who took her as his daughter. Then Syrinx was introduced to a girl with pink hair and told that this was now her younger sister, Frey. It was then that Syrinx realized that this was the first part of the book she had read. She became the protagonist of the first part, who was about to die. The woman woke up in the middle of the night in her bed, sat on the edge of the bed, hid her face in her hands, and realized that perhaps she was dreaming about the past because of fatigue. The second part will tell the story of the second main character, Frey, and the male character, Syrinx's brother. Like the healer, her younger cousin also lost her family and was adopted as a daughter by the Duke. They had a brother, Dante, who lost an eye when he once again defended his sisters from their father. These two people felt the same way as Syrinx, they wanted to escape. In the original story, in the Duke's family, Syrinx was gradually poisoned, after which she passed her power to her sister and died. This is how her story ends in the first book. But now she is alive, and they immediately started looking for her because she is the only person who survived and has such a powerful healing power. After the woman managed to escape from all those who persecuted her and settled in a place where lawlessness rules, she started looking for information about the poison that would still poison her. The main goal is to find a gem that can fulfill her cherished wish. Syrinx cannot leave her sister and brother to those who have abused them since childhood. She hopes that she will soon be able to change everything with the power she has inherited. The woman notices a torn letter on the table, and after putting the pieces together, she notices that the persecutors change the secret code from time to time so that no one can make out the essence of the letter. It's not easy to find a healer because everything she did before was a deception. She and her name look different to others, so her persecutors cannot find her. No one will be able to find Syrinx unless Juan Forsetti comes in person. The healer heard a noise from the other room and got scared and went to check if Lintella had accidentally sent someone else to spend the night here. It's possible that the anxiety rose after that dream about the past. Heimdall was awake, standing in front of the window and asking why the healer was not sleeping. The woman asked if he had heard a strange sound. He replied that he had not heard anything like that or that she might have been hallucinating. The reason is the late night, anxiety about persecutors, so she listens to things she doesn't really have. Heimdall approached the healer and took her hands. He reminded her that his physical abilities were greater than hers, which is why she tied him up. Therefore, she needs to calm down because she will be safe that night, because he is here. The blonde man persuades her to go to rest and promises that no one will disturb her sleep. The blonde tucks a strand of Syrinx's hair behind her ear and advises her not to show her face in this way if she doesn't want to be caught. The man also jokingly asks if she wants him to sleep with her or if he can pet her until she falls asleep. Syrinx refuses and goes up the mountain to her room. The blonde says goodnight. In her bed, Syrinx once again recalls Heimdall's soothing words and is surprised that this man managed to comfort her. The healer recalls the full story of Heimdall, who decided to kill Fry because of her parents' misdeeds. They killed his parents and then sold him and his brother to slave traders. 
Then Heimdall's brother died, leaving him alone in this cruel world, and it was then that his personality split. One of his personalities is a reserved, intelligent, and mature man, and the other is a man mired in madness and thirst for revenge. Searing's realizes that he is a real thief and that his actions have no excuse. The feeling she has for the person who was able to comfort her is very similar to the feeling of unity. In the morning, the kitchen is noisy, and Searing's meets Heimdall in the afternoon and jokes that she thought it was a thief who had broken into the house and was making noise. She asks him if he's hurt. A blonde man accidentally breaks a plate and blushes with shame. A pink apron is tied around his naked torso. Heimdall's new image confuses the healer. She advises not to worry about broken dishes because it's not her house. The man asks in surprise where they are. Syrinx asks him not to move, and she takes out her glasses and puts them on him personally. He is embarrassed by her closeness. The healer asks if he was looking for them. For a blonde man, these are not just glasses. They separate one personality from another. Through the presence of glasses, the daytime Heimdall shows that he will not do what the crazy nighttime Heimdall does. That's why he takes eyewear so seriously. Syrinx pointed at his apron and asked what he was wearing today, if he really wanted to seduce her. The blonde turned red as a tomato. He wrapped his arms around himself to cover some of the open areas on his chest and began to explain that in the morning he found his clothes torn. So he was looking for something to wear, and the man decided to cook something for her. The woman mentioned that he was a good cook. From his appearance, she realized that Heimdall had fully recovered by morning. The man points to his wrists and asks if he can find out how it happened. He is wearing pink transparent shackles that he discovered this morning. Syrinx easily replies that he is bound to her by chains and that other people cannot see them. Recalling the knight's adventures, the healer says that she is not perverted compared to him. Heimdall protests during the day and says that he is not like that either. She is surprised at his lack of emotion. She finds it suspicious. The man explains that he is used to it and has accepted the situation. Syrinx reports that last night he broke the rule and attacked her. Heimdall is not comfortable with this and is worried and asks again. The healer confirms that he tried to knock her down. He raises his shackled hands and asks her what exactly is the reason she decided to take action. The woman says that unfortunately, she could not hit him with the frying pan. Heimdall clenches his fists in anger and says that this is not a serious enough punishment and suggests hitting him now. He promises that he will not say a word against it and asks Heimdall to beat him more often. Syrinx reminds him that this is his body too, so he will be hurt as well. The blonde replies that he is not going to hide behind the fact that he does not remember his actions and is ready to take full responsibility. He folds his hands in front of him and says that he likes to take responsibility. Heimdall clarifies that he does this only with her. He asks what the meaning of the chain is, and the woman explains that it is a guarantee of protection against him. People like her can only defend themselves with magic and spells. The spell will not work forever, but it is a convenient way to control someone for a certain period of time. If he attempts to attack again, he will be chained up in no time. It may not be comfortable for a blonde, but it's perfect for Syrinx. She decides to demonstrate a single command, for example, to order you to come closer. Pink chains rose in the air and pulled him in the right direction. Heimdall was very close to the woman. He was holding onto the table behind her. Syrinx said she could manage it. The blonde man's face was so close that he blushed with shame and warned that if their lips touched now, he would not take responsibility. Syrinx joked and said that she had to take responsibility, and the next moment she moved away and walked away from him. In any case, Heimdall has to be patient and get used to it. In a month, she will think about how to proceed. Syrinx asks us to take this as her reinsurance, and in return, she promises to treat her husband. In fact, when Heimdall asked to treat him, he said it would take two months. Syrinx knows that the second part of the novel will begin in two months. Then he will gain great power and will face her stepfather, the Duke of Adverse, and her fiancé, Esir. The healer will, of course, support Heimdall. She wants these two men dead, and so she is not going to stop the blonde. He looks at her and has no idea what she is thinking. Syrinx smiles silently, and the man covers his eyes with his hand, unable to bear her gaze. She thinks about how she will escape with Frey while everyone is fighting with each other. 
Even if there is no fray, these three men will still face each other in a fight. Heimdall craves power, and Duke Adverse and Aesir are not going to share it. The main thing is that Syrinx is still alive, although according to the original work, she was supposed to die in the first part. However, now she does not know what the future holds for everyone. Heimdall hesitantly asks if he is now considered her property. The healer is surprised to find out that he really thinks she will force him to do anything. Syrinx calms him down by explaining that she will not do this to him until he attacks her again. She doesn't like to take away other people's freedom. She had to go through something similar herself, so she doesn't like the suffering of others. In the first part of the book, she experienced a lot of cruelty and humiliation, but her brother and sister still feel it. Syrinx smiles and says that she doesn't know why she is telling him everything, but the night Heimdall left her no choice. She asks him not to think about anything and to focus on his recovery. Noticing the torn sofa, the woman assumed that Heimdall had been wounded again, and she was right. Syrinx says that it is not her fault, but she can heal his wounds if he does not mind. Heimdall asked if she would be okay. She assured me that it was, because it was her job. The healer tells us that she treats someone from time to time, that he is not her only patient, and mentally adds that he is the only one who keeps coming back for her treatment. Syrinx asks if Heimdall is interested in what happened last night, but she suggests that they eat first and then discuss everything. The man is in a hurry to cook, and the healer doesn't know where to look away from his seductive image in an apron. Having scooped up the cooked dish with a spoon, Syrinx voiced her observations that despite his waking up in an unfamiliar place, he looked completely relaxed. He seems to take it for granted. Heimdall puts an egg on the table and holds a frying pan in his other hand. He guessed that she had brought him to the house of a person she trusted. Syrinx wonders how he knows that it was she who brought him. The blonde explains that he feels her presence in the house, so he decided to cook something for the two of them. She asks me, wait, do you feel my presence? Heimdall touches his neck and says that he has a little bit of this ability. The healer is not happy about this news at all. She tried to escape from her stepfather and Essir countless times. The only thing she was sure of was her ability to hide her presence. It was a big blow for her to learn that this man felt her presence because he was strong and crazy. Heimdall, unaware of her thoughts, is having a nice breakfast. Syrinx hopes that this time there will be no bullying of Frey, because she will not be able to just watch. The healer continued the conversation, asking why he trusted her. The blonde man replied that he was glad last time that the healer did not leave him on the street outside the house, even though she knew the danger he posed. Syrinx says with a smile that despite her crazy love of money, she is not the type to ignore her clients. While the man did not really understand where the conversation was going, the healer stood up and said that in the future, he could become her client. Heimdall stopped eating and looked at the healer. She asked him, My dear client, you have a lot of money. She walks over to him, leans on the table next to him, touches his shoulder, and asks if he's thought about buying some gems, and Syrinx might even make a discount for him. Of all the words Heimdall said, one made him blush when she called him dear. Syrinx asked him what thoughts he had when he heard the word. Touching his hair, the healer says that they are now very close to each other, and she wonders if he is getting used to her and her face. Heimdall pushes the plate off the table in shame, and the dishes with the dish break on the floor. Syrinx emotionally calls him handsome. If Lintella asked her to pay for everything, she would be able to offer her this man at any time, the healer thought. The next day, they decided to get down to business. They could have stayed in the shelter for a few more days, but they don't have time for that. Her husband thought the store was only in her house, but it wasn't. The other place they came to was the second store Syrinx worked at three years ago. Heimdall wonders how the old customers will find her if she opens her shop here. The healer is confident that her clients will somehow find her, because this is a feature of their field of work. The woman ran her finger over the surface with a thick layer of dust. Holding a ball of dust in her fingers, she thought that it was necessary to clean up the place. Syrinx went on to explain that if a person buys gems, it means that they have money, so it is easier for them to find information that can also make them rich. The healer turned to him and told him not to move, that she was going to show him her power. The room was filled with the colorful shimmer of gems controlled by Syrinx. The word fuera was spoken, the stone flashed brightly and the room became clear. The dust disappeared from all surfaces, 
and the small bottles and containers stood on the shelves as if they were new. Heimdall clarified that she had just cleaned the room. Cyrene said that to be precise, she took them back in time to find a pure and untreated stone. She spoke of a large black pearl lying on a red cloth. At the moment, the big stone is not very good. The man asked what she wanted to do with it, and the healer replied that she would return the stone. There's a saying in Creekside Lane that you have to be prepared for betrayal at any time. As soon as you feel someone's hand on the back of your head, immediately grab it and then cut it off. If it were not for this rule, her body would have been carried away by the River Umpta long ago. This helped her in the case of the trap set by the Blessing of Darkness and the knights who organized the raid on her store last night. Now they will be looking for her much more carefully, especially Torch's mongrels, to whom she is going to return the stolen item. Syrinx addressed Heimdall by name, which surprised him. He did not expect her to know his name. It was just the first time the healer called him that way. The woman asks him if he would like to hurt the people who hurt him. He clarified whether she meant revenge. Syrinx confirmed that it could be considered revenge and asked if he was on the same page with her. Heimdall agreed to help, and with his hand on his heart, he promised to do whatever she asked, and she could also use his body for this. Syrinx knows that the second part of the novel will soon begin, in which Heimdall will gain incredible power. His revenge will begin with the betrayal of his mentor. She says she will use his help because the situation is urgent. The woman takes out all the records of gem sales from the previous year. Since she hasn't systematized anything, Heimdall has a lot of work ahead of her. The pursuers are very organized and there are a lot of them. So while they are under Lintella's protection, you need to do everything as quickly as possible. Here you can find information about the exchange of gems by Crixus auction houses. Syrinx gathered this information through connections and money. After reviewing several pages of records, Heimdall replied that he could organize the necessary information. This is exactly what the healer expected from an intelligent man. Syrinx also asked me to write in as legible a handwriting as possible. In the meantime, she went about her business, spreading out records with pictures of jewelry around and checking each one for authenticity. You need to be careful that when it reaches its goal, no one will guess anything. It took some time for Syrinx to complete its work. She rubbed her neck tiredly and asked how Heimdall was doing. Her husband noticed that she was very enthusiastic about her work. He has heard of people who can heal with gemstones, but as far as he knows, this is a rare phenomenon. Syrinx realized that the daytime Heimdall knew about her abilities. She sat down closer to him and explained that this was not a very rare phenomenon, but that these people were hiding behind the altar of discipline. The healer thinks that it is important for her to hide her name, appearance, and abilities, and that the fact that someone knows her as a jeweler is not important. Heimdall showed the result of his work, systematized information. The woman was pleased and appreciated that he had actually made the notes in legible handwriting. Syrinx said she plans to sell Aslot's tears on the black market. Blondie clarified whether it was the market in the first district. The black market is one of the names of the auction house. It differs from regular auctions in that its sponsors are loan sharks and murderers. In such places, fraudsters play for money, and nobles sell and buy slaves. Today we will hold an auction, which takes place twice a month. Since they have fake IDs from Lintella, it's worth going to this event. According to Syrinx's guess, the jewels on the list are skillfully made fakes, and she learned about them from her last trip. Some of them are made by the healer herself. While the man was listening, Syrinx went to the closet. She thanked him for his help, otherwise she would not have had time to do everything herself. If everything goes according to plan, they will be able to sell this jewel. Opening a closet of outfits and wigs, she continued to say that the moment people saw the jewel, they would go crazy, and the price would be so high that it would break all auction records. Syrinx turned to the blonde and said that from now on he had to choose whether to follow her or not because the game they would play that night would be very dangerous. If they manage to sell this gem at a good price, they will be able to take revenge on those people in a beautiful way. The buyers will then be arrested for this jewelry. The Count's family wants to get the necklace before the Imperial family. So if they find out that the necklace is actually fake, they should not expect mercy from them. These people will never see the light of day again, and will also experience the torture of the imperial prison. 
Cyrene did not say that after that she would take revenge on Duke Adversus and Aesir, who killed her family. At dusk, the man bowed his head, and when he looked up, it was Heimdall at night. He smiled and asked Syrinx if his glasses fit him. She frowned and wondered when he managed to change so quickly and asked him to warn her next time. The woman asked if he could pretend to be a normal person for once. Heimdall replied that there was nothing he could not handle. The blonde asks why she perceives him as normal during the day and asks him to explain what being normal means to her. Heimdall says that she missed something from the beginning, that all the crazy people were normal at first. The crazier a person is, the better they are at pretending to be normal as he does. The blonde was smiling with satisfaction. Syrinx thought it was nonsense and said they had to go. Heimdall asks where they need to go. The healer is angry with him for hearing everything but pretending to know nothing. She offers him to go with her, but I don't, so he can leave. The blonde saw the notes and started commenting on the handwriting as lifeless, but it was clear that he was trying for her. Syrinx corrected him, saying that it was not he who helped her. Heimdall saw the woman open a chest with gold coins and precious stones. He wondered if it was a safe by any chance. The healer asked him if he wanted to rob in her absence and said that it would not work because he needed her hand to open the safe. It responds to her fingerprints. Heimdall voiced the idea of cutting off the hand that opens the safe. Syrinx asked him threateningly to kick him out of the house. She found a thing that would play a key role in their case and threw a black cloak in the man's direction, asking him to put it on. Also dressed in a black cloak, the healer suggested that we leave. On the street, Syrinx touched a certain brick in the wall to cross the street. The healer knows that there are wizard trackers in the passageways between the rooms who can easily recognize disguises. So then they need to use something else in the room. She called a few words of incantation and a secret entrance shown in the wall. Syrinx looked back and saw that the blonde was in no hurry to enter. She told him to come in quickly. She is a master at finding such places. Heimdall asked if the gemstone served as a key. The healer did not want to reveal the secret, but explained that this stone was similar to his glasses. Despite his good eyesight, he wears them. They found themselves in a space similar to the starry sky with spiral staircases high up. This is a secret passage. Syrinx warned that the door was easier than this. If they make even one mistake, they are finished. The man stared at the secret passage in amazement. They are surrounded by dishonest people everywhere, and this passage is proof of that. The road to the auction house borders the most depraved neighborhood. It is really hard to get into an auction house because of the strict surveillance. Many rich people don't want to take any unnecessary risks, so they went so far as to hire a magician to create a secret passage. With this login, they can enter the auction house for free, although this is not entirely safe. Heimdall asked if there were any pitfalls. Syrinx explained that these stairs are not real. They are made of magic. All she can do here is change the color of the stairs to purple. Everything else is an illusion. As soon as he steps on a step, it disappears. There are no other pitfalls. A yellow gemstone shone in front of them, and the healer said she was not particularly good at such things. In her mind, she knows that if she were alone, she would use her abilities and get out of here. Syrinx said that he would have to try a little harder today. They hugged each other around the waist, and the healer cheerfully said, pointing upwards, Well, follow me, puppy. The woman thought that she should repay him with food later. The healer learned about this route from the fourth healed patient, who is an elite knight. She was so drunk that she couldn't walk on her own. Today she will use this route for the second time. Last time it was hard for Syrinx to carry a drunken carcass, so this time it will be much easier to walk, and she won't have to go off for ten days. Of course, she can use the gems to fly, but flying is too much for her. The healer points her finger up the mountain, where a blue circle is visible, and explains that they need to go only where there is a purple color, and at the very end, there will be a door. The man asked how other people get there. Syrinx replied that others bring a wizard and fly with him. 